Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight. I'm Brandis Friedman here in our Northwest Side studio. And I'm Paris Chess reporting live from Chicago's Brighton Park neighborhood. On the show tonight, what President Trump's executive order on immigration means. Google and Apple's coronavirus tracking tool poses some data and privacy questions. Staying financially afloat during the coronavirus, meet a local truck driver and his family. Jeffrey Baer takes a swing at some baseball history and a virtual tour of some exceptional art made by self-taught artists. But first, Brandis, I'm here anchoring, co-anchoring in the Brighton Park neighborhood on the southwest side. There, uh, this neighborhood has been hit disproportionately hard by the COVID-19 pandemic. We'll explain to you why that is and what local service agencies are trying to do about it. But first, back to you and the latest developments from today. Paris, thank you. After much anticipation, Governor J.B. Pritzker announces an extension of the state's stay-at-home order through May 30th with modifications. Without the extension, Pritzker says hospitals would be overwhelmed and more people would be infected. If we lifted the stay-at-home order tomorrow, we would see our deaths per day shoot into the thousands by the end of May. And that would last well into the summer. Our hospitals would be full and very sick people would have nowhere to go. One of the modifications requires wearing masks, face masks in public places where a six foot social distance can't be met. This includes kids over the age of two. Also, state parks will be reopened in phases and greenhouses and garden centers may reopen as essential businesses. Non-essential retail stores may reopen to only to fulfill orders through pickup and delivery. Also, the Illinois Department of Public Health says there have been 123 deaths since yesterday, bringing the total number of fatalities in the state to 1,688. The state reports an additional 1,800 people having tested positive, bringing that total to nearly 37,000. A federal judge will decide if social distancing and other COVID-19 protocols at Cook County Jail are being properly followed. This after U.S. District Judge Matthew Kennelly earlier this month rejected a motion seeking the mass release of all medically vulnerable detainees in the jail. Attorneys representing detainees say the jail isn't doing enough to protect them from further spread. Sheriff Tom Dart has been emphatic about the efforts his office is making including attempts to enforce social distancing, distributing personal protective gear, and adding isolation beds. Now, as of this evening, there are 223 detainees who've tested positive for COVID-19 in the Cook County Jail. Another 231 are recovering at a facility there. And additionally, 166 correctional officers have also tested positive. Some nursing home workers say they're getting infected with COVID-19 and being fired for speaking out about not having enough personal protective equipment. The union representing them, SEIU Healthcare, is calling on nursing homes, which have been particularly impacted by the spread of the coronavirus, to agree to a one-year contract implementing necessary health and safety protocols. Chandria Foster, a certified nursing assistant at Prairie Oasis Nursing Home in South Holland, says she's experiencing some COVID-19 symptoms and is still going into work. This goes past just going to work talking in. We go to work, we clock in, we need what we need, but we have to come home. At this current moment, I have no taste, I have no smell. I am I'm myself waiting to be tested. I was asked, I was actually told that I can continue to work um, around the patients and around my coworkers because I'm not coughing and I'm not sneezing. The group represents 12,000 nursing home workers at over 100 facilities. COVID-19 has also had a disproportionate impact on Black and Latino communities across Chicago. Paris Schutz has been reporting on the coronavirus pandemic in different communities across the area. He spent today in the southwest side neighborhood of Brighton Park, a majority Hispanic Latino area located just east of Midway Airport and south of Little Village on the other side of the former Crawford smokestack that was demolished two weeks ago. He joins us now from 42nd and Archer in Brighton Park. Hey, Paris. Hey, Brandis. Yeah, one resident said the situation in Brighton Park and surrounding communities like Gage Park and Archer Heights has been dire. Now it is critical mass because of the COVID-19 pandemic. 
Now, there are large populations here that work on very low wages, so the pandemic has sort of exacerbated problems that have existed in this community for a long time. And this is in one of the zip codes that has seen one of the highest rates of positive COVID-19 cases in the city. So it is, in fact, a health crisis here, compounded by the fact that kids are home from school, many parents are home from work, and many community health providers have to step in. One of them, the Esperanza Center, is located in the heart of Brighton Park. They have ramped up their COVID-19 testing in recent weeks, so they're reporting nearly 470 positive coronavirus cases since their testing began. In fact, on Monday they say they tested 70 people. 50 of those tests have come back positive. Now the center CEO says that this community struggles with some of the comorbidities that have been reported on a lot that make coronavirus so deadly in many cases, but there are also other cultural factors at play as well. People are afraid to go to the hospital because they're afraid of the bills. And we, um, we really need to make a commitment as a community that this treatment is going to be free for people. They also tend to live in crowded households, so multi-generational households with the abuelitos staying with them, little kids, uh, and a single bathroom for maybe six people, right? Um, and so they have an extremely difficult time with social distancing. Add to that the fact that many residents here still have to go to work if they work in essential industries, so they may put themselves at risk. There are other agencies like the Southwest Collective that has tried to step in and lift up this community even in good times, but right now that process is even more difficult. We got to a point where folks can't afford the necessities like clothes, shoes. I had somebody reach out and ask us if we had a car seat. Um, someone else needed a crib mattress. Like, we're at that level on a daily basis. So to have to do things like this anyway, and then to have that compounded by something like a pandemic, which affects these neighborhoods disproportionately because everyone here works at restaurants and, and stores and small businesses which have been forced to close. So now not only are our small businesses affected, but so are the neighbors. Um, no one has any money or anything. And to put this in this perspective, take a look at the line that we saw here for a food drive at the Immaculate Conception Church on 44th in California. Now, this drive happens about once a month, but the organizers say they prepared today for about 100 more folks. So this line stretched for blocks. People got there as early as 7 a.m., even though the doors to the church didn't open until 4 p.m. to give away essential food items. Our produce, rice, beans, you know, stuff that lasts a long time and it'll hold you over to the next month. Park. Well, small business does play a role here, Brandis, although it's dominated in these communities by manufacturing, mid-size plants, uh, industry, intermodal transportation facilities. So it's tough for small business to get a hold. Add to that the fact that there are lots of big box retailers, especially on Pulaski. So the Southwest Collective formed a chamber of commerce just to tackle that problem. Now we met one small business owner, an independent photographer, who says that as large gatherings and events and celebrations have stopped, so too has her work. Everything stops. Like I, I, there's a couple of deposits that I had to return. I didn't have to based on the contract, but I did because it is unprecedented times. And as a family, myself, I struggle financially, so I refunded what I could. Um, a lot of weddings are pending, um, so it's just, it's been very difficult. All of that said, there is a strong community spirit here. We saw examples of residents who put out tables of food and stuff for their neighbors to come borrow or take if they so need. So it's a community that struggles, but a community that is bound together. And in just a bit, we'll speak with the area's alderman, Ray Lopez, who is one of the fiercest critics of Mayor Lori Lightfoot. So hear why he does not want the mayor to have emergency spending powers in this pandemic. And now back to you, Brandis. Yeah, it's a tough time in that community, Paris. Thank you. And now to Phil Ponce in the debate over President Trump's 60-day green card suspension. Phil. 
Brandis, will putting further restrictions on immigration help American workers? President Donald Trump apparently thinks so. This week, he signed an executive order that restricts some immigration to the United States for the next 60 days. The order comes after the president's tweet Monday evening that he would, quote, temporarily suspend immigration into the United States. The tweet prompted concern among immigration activists as well as businesses reliant on migrant workers that the president was contemplating a complete immigration shutdown. But the new executive order falls far short of that. Joining us now to give us their thoughts on the executive order are David Applegate. He's an attorney and member of the conservative and libertarian legal group, the Federalist Society. He's also an advisor on legal policy to the Hartman Institute. Institute. And Erendira Rendon, she's vice president of immigration strategy and advocacy at the Resurrection Project, which advocates and provides services related to issues of affordable housing and immigrant rights. And thank you both for joining us. Before we begin our discussion, let's take a closer look at the president's executive order. And here's what it calls for. It stops people outside the U.S. getting green cards for 60 days. It stops parents, adult children, siblings from getting green cards through family members, but spouses and children under 21 of U.S. citizens can still get green cards. Medical professionals are exempt, and the order does not restrict temporary non-immigrant work visas. So that's what the, uh, that's a summary of the executive order. And Dev uh, David Applegate, uh, to what extent is this executive order consistent with what the president tweeted on Monday? Well, in typical Trumpian fashion, this is um, sort of his second offer after his initial approach. Um, President Trump, being a businessman, his particular style of negotiation is to start by asking for or demanding more than he wants, perhaps outrageously so, and then scaling it back. But as usual, he manages to command what uh, President Teddy Roosevelt called the bully pulpit by putting all the attention on him on his order, and when it actually comes out, uh, it's really very much in harmony with the Supreme Court decision in Trump versus Hawaii, the so-called Muslim ban case. It's already been vetted by the Supreme Court, and uh, the effects are going to be very, very minor, I think. At Endira, uh, Rendon, uh, even though it's, uh, it's, it does not implement what he called for on Monday. What is the impact of the order? Does the order have an impact nonetheless? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, this is a time when we should really be uniting and really be lifting up the stories of immigrants. 29% of all of our doctors in the U.S. are, are immigrants. 23% of all nurses are immigrants, essential workers, farm workers, people that work in grocery stores are immigrants. Um, and so um, it definitely pins people against each other and it definitely makes immigrants look like we're um, taking jobs when in reality we are essential workers and we are also uh, job creators ourselves. Uh, David Applegate, uh, in light of the fact that uh, the president's executive order lines up with uh, established Supreme Court law and so forth, why do you think he did it? Is it not the prerogative of the president to issue an order consistent with Supreme Court precedent? Um, I, I'm not sure I understand the gist of the question. I suppose the uh, answer may be that in an election year, everything is political and immigration is President Trump's number one issue. It is largely what got him elected in 2016. And he probably wants to keep a focus on that in 2020. Uh, Arendira Rendon, do you agree that, uh, that his motivation might have had a political component to it? Yeah, um, absolutely. I mean, he's uh, trying to talk to his base, um, trying to say that he can uh, stop immigration when the reality is um, he can't stop all immigration, right? Um, and, um, you know, in definitely trying to place blame on the lack of jobs right now on uh, some, you know, immigrants when really it's about COVID-19. Um, and so, um, yeah, and, you know, trying to distract from the fact that we are the epicenter of uh, the COVID-19 uh, COVID crisis. David Applegate, why do you think the policy isn't, uh, might not have been more sweeping, say, to have included uh, temporary uh, people who are, are applying for temporary work visas? Because I think the president 
he is trying to balance two things here. He is trying to balance national security, uh, national health security, that is, in light of the COVID-19 pandemic, with the increasing need for seasonal workers as we move into the spring planting season, and then the, uh, the growing season, and eventually the fall harvest season. So, David Applegate, you know, uh, uh, let me stick with you for a second. Uh, to, to what extent would this have actually helped with the one of the stated reasons in the president's tweet on Monday had to do with unemployment? Will this have a significant impact on addressing this country's unemployment problem? Simply because of the numbers, Phil, that is not going to be the case. We have record numbers of people filing for unemployment now. Uh, many of them self-employed, small business people, uh, some people getting laid off from larger businesses, of course. Even in a typical year, uh, according to State Department figures, we have about 1 million people applying for green cards. And about 80% of those go to people who are already legally resident in the United States. So the actual numerical impact, I think, is going to be very small, but to the extent that the president, as any politician does, is, as uh, Aaron Deere said, uh, playing to his base, there is a certain psychological component here, which I think is important in times of national distress. And he is telling people um, psychologically, look, I've got your back. Uh, the numbers may not be terribly significant, but if it helps one person, who lost a job, regained that job, then that's one more person who has a slightly better life than he or she may have had absent this. Uh, and then the uh, it, it, the president's uh, the president in 2016 made immigration his signature issue. Uh, to what extent do you think immigration will be his signature issue uh, in this upcoming uh, campaign election? I think he'll. Uh, I think the president will definitely try to make immigration um, front and center. You're seeing it with this executive order. Um, we'll see what happens with the Supreme Court when they rule around DACA. Um, and um, you know, as as much as we'll be, as much as he's going to be able to pivot away from the um, crisis that we're in now. Um, and it, it, it'll come at the expense, right, of immigrants that are already in the country. And right now we should be telling immigrants, don't be fearful, you know, stay at home if you need to stay at home, go to the doctor if you need to, because this is a public health crisis. And we should be taking care of everybody that lives um, in the U.S. to make sure that, you know, we're keeping everybody safe. David Applegate, Erendira Rendon, thank you both for joining us. We very much appreciate your insights. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you. And up next, we go back to parachutes in Brighton Park, but first, a look at the weather. Still to come on Chicago Tonight, Google and Apple's coronavirus contact tracing tool. Should, the people, should people trust the tech giants with more of our data? Working only one day a week takes a financial toll. Meet a South Side truck driver and his family adjusting to the coronavirus pandemic. A look at how Major League Baseball survived previous pandemics. Getting inside a show of outsider art closed by the shutdown. And tips to wearing a face mask and eyeglasses at the same time. It'll keep those glasses clean, too. The goal is uh, to have the unconstitutional governor mandates, uh, the executive order, removed completely. And your thoughts about Carol Marine's conversation with the leader of the reopened Illinois movement. But first, we check back in with Paris Schutz, who's co-anchoring the show tonight from the Brighton Park neighborhood on the southwest side of Chicago. Paris. Brandis, I might need some tips on uh, not fogging glasses. I'm going to wear a mask right now for our interview with 15th Ward Alderman Raymond Lopez. Alderman Lopez, thank you so much for coming out here tonight. Welcome um, to the neighborhood. So, so tell me, you know, we've met a lot of people in the community today saying, you know, the situation is, is pretty troublesome with all the COVID-19 cases and, and other problems that the community faces. How has your community responded, do you think? You know, my community... Uh, here we're in Brighton Park, but like back of the yards in West Angle, they're doing the best that they can to survive. Many communities already were having issues as it relates to resources, and this has just compounded the matter. Unfortunately, 
my neighborhoods are comprised of a lot of the essential workers that are still required to go out to provide for their families and to survive, particularly the undocumented community, which already was struggling even before this. And, you know, they're still worried about their families. They're still worried about making ends meet and putting food on the table. And it's really put a strain on all of the resources that are out there in the community as not only they continue to ask for more support, but now there are thousands more needing help. Certainly the social service providers are, are stepping up and, and filling an essential need right now. Um, Alderman, you're one of the mayor's uh, toughest critics. You oppose her move to have emergency spending powers under this pandemic. Why is that? You know, on March 18th, she gave herself an executive order that granted emergency powers. It's been in effect now for several weeks. And zip codes like 60632, where we're at, are still among the most hardest hit with COVID-19. They have some of the highest positive rates in the city of Chicago, with also, conversely, the lowest testing rates in the city of Chicago. And if we haven't been able to get it right with the executive order, nothing has changed in the emergency powers ordinance that tells me that more resources are going to come to communities in need. And especially now that we have the ability to meet online, to meet instantaneously almost from our own homes or our offices, there's nothing to say that we can't move the city's business at breakneck speed when we need to. And so you're saying you should get a council meeting together and vote on certain spending items related to coronavirus, as opposed to having the mayor have the unilateral authority to make those decisions. Aldermen are the representatives of the people and we're the guardians of their tax dollars. And we should not be the afterthought. We should be very much at the forefront of what's going on. For example, there's over $200 million in unfilled jobs that we could tap into, the money that we put aside for positions we've never filled, to put resources into every neighborhood like Brighton Park, like West Englewood, like Austin, and we're not doing that because we're not part of the discussion. And to say that it's too cumbersome or too slow to involve us in our ideas is a huge mistake. And we've seen that for the past several weeks. And if that is to continue through June or even further into the fall, It'll just be to our detriment as a city. Now, let me ask you, you, you led an effort at yesterday's council meeting to defer and publish. This is a tactic to not have a vote uh, on an issue. And so they called the city council meeting for tomorrow, where ostensibly they will have a vote. Do you think there are the votes there to stop um, the mayor's wishes to have that spending power? Well, it's not a matter of whether I think the votes are there. Apparently, the mayor thinks the votes are there, because if she wanted to proceed, she wouldn't have called for the meeting to end yesterday to try and force us to come back Friday. That was a punitive measure to all the aldermen that mayors constantly use to say, well, if you're not gonna do our business today, I'm gonna drag you back in two days. If she was confident in our business and her ability to pass this, we could have continued with the meeting yesterday, done all the ordinances in other city business that has languished since she canceled the meeting in March, and we could have still moved forward and still address this later. All right, Alderman Ray Lopez, stay safe. Thank you for being out Thank here you. with us. And we'll watch that vote tomorrow. And now, Brandis, we'll be back more with some more of the issues in the Brighton Park community. But first, we toss it back to you. Yeah, it should be an interesting day at City Hall tomorrow. Paris, thank you. Up next, Google and Apple partner up to help fight COVID-19. Will people trust them with their data? Stay with us. Don't ever miss Chicago Tonight. Subscribe to our podcast. Get a daily download of our show delivered to your desktop or mobile device. Go to WTTW.com slash Chicago Tonight Podcast and subscribe. As governors grapple with the question of when to reopen their states, the need for a well-organized, wide-scale contact tracing effort is at the top of many experts' lists. Rival tech giants Google and Apple announced a collaborative plan that would use smartphones to aid in the effort. And Apple CEO Tim Cook says the first draft of their effort would be working by next Tuesday. But the plan raises questions about effectiveness and data privacy. Joining us to talk about that are Derek Eater, founder of Data Made, a civic technology company. He's also co-founder of Shy Hack Night, a weekly gathering of web designers and developers who volunteer time to solve urban problems. And Blaze Err, assistant professor in computer science at the University of Chicago. Thanks to you both for joining us. Glad to be here. Um, so before we get to concerns about privacy, let's kind of start with the basics um, and just getting some facts about what this is all about. Blaze, what is contact tracing and what is its role in getting all of us back out outside? Absolutely. So the, the whole idea of contact tracing is we need to know uh, when individuals who have COVID-19 
um, you know, come across someone else and possibly um, you know, are contagious, uh, pass on uh, the virus, right? And so, you know, the problem is we often don't know until afterwards that someone has COVID-19. So we have to have a system to know who you've seen in the past, right? And so you can think of many really invasive ways to do this. Like you could imagine, and this is not what's being proposed, tracking your own location, uploading that to Google and saying, you figure out, you know, who's who I've come across. So what's actually being proposed is that phones will use Bluetooth, which is the same technology that, you know, you use to connect your phone to your car stereo. Uh, wirelessly or your Bluetooth speaker, right? And what and that has this nice property that it's pretty short range. So what your phone's going to do is, as you're walking around, your phone's going to just basically pick a, a pseudonym for itself, some long number. Just think of it; it just makes up a name, right? And it's just going to broadcast like, "Hi, I'm Blaze. Hi, I'm Blaze. Hi, I'm Blaze." And anyone who's in, uh, you know, within a couple of feet from you is going to pick that up and record it. And so for privacy, every couple of minutes, you're going to pick a new name, right? And so your phone's going to keep track of all the names you've broadcast, and it's names are from a space large enough that's unlikely anyone else will pick the same, right? And so then let's say you come down with potential COVID-19 systems, you go to your healthcare provider, and then at that point, your healthcare provider, um, after diagnosing you with COVID-19, will click a button, upload this, right? And so then everyone else who's using this app, who's remembered all the names they've heard yelled out um, over Bluetooth, Right. they'll get this list um, you know, from Google and Apple and say, oh, did I come across anyone who subsequently uh, was diagnosed? Okay, and so all that stuff will start talking to each other. Um, Derek, why do Google and Apple believe they can help with contact tracing? Well, they are two of the largest uh, tech companies uh, in the world, and they also own about 99% of the smartphone market. So they seem well positioned to roll something like this out at scale. Uh, but that being said, there's still going to be some limits to the kinds of folks uh, and, and the number of folks that they're going to be able to roll this out to. Uh, and, and Blaze, what are Google and Apple proposing exactly? Right, so what they're proposing is essentially this backend technology, what's called an API. So it's they're basically configuring their phones so that they can follow this protocol for yelling out your name, uh, the name you make up uh, over Bluetooth, right? And so then what they're actually gonna do is um, healthcare, uh, you know, well, county level um, or you know, state level healthcare providers and organizations will actually build the apps to do this. So Google and Apple aren't gonna actually fully build the app. They're just basically building kind of the foundational technology to do this. And they're gonna first be rolling this out um, you know, through their own apps. And then eventually the plan is to push this into the core of the operating system. Um, Derek, w what are the opt-in points for consumers or opt-out for that matter? Yeah, for sure. So it, as, as mentioned, it's an opt-in system. So you don't have to turn this thing on if you don't want to. Um, Apple uh, has a pretty good way of pushing out updates for their phones. Um, and so it'll be pretty easy, I think, for most iPhone users to be able to turn this on if they want to, just from their settings on their phone. Android is a different story, though. It's an open source platform, and there are many versions of Android, custom versions of Android that exist out there. Uh, and so there's you know, quite a few new versions that, that will probably get the update, but older versions are still pretty common out there. I think a quarter of all uh, Android phones that are out there are using operating systems that are over five years old. So there's really a, a, a challenge in the Android space, which is about a quarter of the smartphone um, uh, phones that exist out there. Um, there's a real challenge to, to rolling it out to all of all of those. But once you get the update, if you get it, then you will have the option to opt in. And it'll be on Google and Apple to convince you that this is something that is safe, something that uh, is worth doing. Uh, and you know, it won't really work unless enough people do it. I believe the number they say that they need to get is around 60% of, uh, of the population to use this kind of um, system, this application for it to be effective. Um, that's a pretty high bar to clear. And, and, and while we're on it, you know, this obviously raises some privacy concerns. Uh, what kind of concerns do you have, Derek? So uh, as Blaze described, the system is uh, one that actually does take privacy very seriously. And I would say that of the schemes that are possible, uh, it is uh, better than ones that say, for example, track your location, right? Uh, but there are still ways that this information, even though it is anonymized, right? It's making up these names and broadcasting it to other phones. Um, it's possible to, you know, for someone who got a notification, well, maybe I only saw two people in the last you know, month or something like that that are outside of you know, the folks that I'm sheltering in place with, you can pretty easily identify someone in that circumstance. There's also ways that the, the Bluetooth technology itself could be exploited. Uh, the fact that it is sort of an open broadcast kind of a protocol means that someone could just sit out there you know, if they wanted to, right, with some sort of system that just 
extract and try to just consume all the Bluetooth information that came within close proximity to it and then could then collect some of this data. Um, I would say though that you know that is not a huge concern. It's hard to do something at scale um, uh, and, and, and expose people to uh, having their information being breached uh, with this scheme. So it, it does have some holes in it, but it's not you know no you know really wide uh, uh, potential uh, shortcomings. And Blaze, we've got about twenty seconds left. You know, if if Google and Apple, if they say they're building this for good, should we be worried? You know, I think, you know, Google um, and Apple have a reputation for uh, violating our privacy. You know, the scheme as described is similar to what a lot of academics have come up with. And so it's, you know, at the core of the scheme is right, but you know, there was uh, some core problems like, is the system going to be repurposed afterwards? Will we say, well, they could say, oh, well, you know, it wasn't so bad. Why don't we use this for advertising too? What is the end of life plan? Like when, who gets to turn off the system, uh, you know, when the pandemic is under control? Who's being left out, you know? Are the, you know, who doesn't have a phone? Who's going to see this? Um, and, you know, choose to opt out. And does this uh, disparately impact different demographic communities, socioeconomic communities in Chicago? And are, in fact, the people who are most vulnerable to COVID-19 the least likely to uh, be part of the system? And so I think there are, you know, there are privacy concerns, especially regarding the regulation. And there are major equity concerns with how this is going to be rolled out and who's actually going to get it. A lot of questions. Thanks to Blazer and Derek Eater. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Brandis. If Shea Chappelle's Chappell's wheels aren't spinning, he's not making money. The truck driver is down to one day of work per week because of the coronavirus, and his family is suffering financially. But paying the bills isn't Shea's only concern. He suffers from diabetes, which makes the virus potentially life-threatening. And Shea has seen others in his Southside Chicago community with, un with other underlying health conditions succumb to the virus. As part of our new WTTW digital series, First Hand Coronavirus, here's Shay's story. I've been driving trucks for 14 years. I just work for the company. They provide the trucks, they provide the loads, and they pay you according to your mileage. The wheel's not moving, you're not making anything. Normally I work five days a week. Now, due to the corona, uh, I'm working one day a week. This is just stressful, you know? I know the car companies are doing some deferment, so that may be another option. Kiana's the backbone of the family, you know? So she's the one who handles all the situations, you know, within the household financially. She keep everything in line, keep me in line, keep, the, you know, our kids, the bills, everything in line. So we got to figure all of this out. You know, lights don't stop, you know, bills don't stop. You have car notes, you have insurance, you have life insurance, you have so much. I'm also a diabetic. So by me being a diabetic, that's a stressful situation as well. Worrying, you know, who I'm interacting with, still risking my life going to work, because you don't know. We don't know if a mask is going to help. We don't know if a glove is going to help. It'll kill you by just by worrying. Can you focus on what you're doing, please? Okay. With the virus, the black communities are getting hit harder because of our condition as far as health. You're a bread. The high blood pressure, the diabetes, asthma. I have some childhood friends that one of them passed away from this. I've been knowing him since I was 12 years old. Your sandwich is ready, Shay. I had another friend. He lost his mother in the hospital. That was the last time he seen her, taking her to the hospital. Like, that's tough. These are, like, you losing your, your loved ones. So if you're not affecting this, something, you're not human. Who wants to show you daddy's nice? Have a little son, too, five years old, Zaire. You ready? Yeah. Set? Go. Crazy part, he still don't get tired though. He want to play every second. You know, I'm old now, I can't play every second. Four, come on, come on. We try to keep ourselves occupied in the household, make the best of it. We work out together. Wait, 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 wait. you cheating. That ain't, that ain't how it works. Come on back. I'm just doing, we just doing suicide, mm -hmm. no, right? y'all not finna cheat me today. Ready, set, go. <laughs> <laughs> but that, those little things we do just to, you know, keep your mind focused off this virus and this madness. So I'm a realistic thinker. I don't see it's getting any better. Even if they, they say, okay, we can get out tomorrow. So everybody come out. So now we still back in the same situation we, we've been in. So it's going to take time. Actually, at the end of the day, you're still having bills rolling. There you go.
the number families in the correct places. These times has really changed the whole world, not just me, it's, you know, the whole world. It's a worry, but I don't let it bother my mind because it really stress people out. Like, hey, you know, man, I got this bill, I got that, you know. Just just gotta keep moving, keep keep striding, you know. I'm a survivor, so I make it happen. And Shay's story is part of a series of first-hand accounts from Chicagoans coping with this public health crisis. You can watch the series online at WTTW.com slash coronavirus. And now we check back in with Paris Schutz, who's co-anchoring the show from Brighton Park on the city's southwest side. Paris. Yeah, Brandis, we're joined now by Patrick Brosnan, who is the head of the Brighton Park Neighborhood Council, which provides a wide array of services here in the Brighton Park community. Thanks for being out here with us. Thank you so much, Paris. All right, so on the ground in this community, what are the biggest challenges that you are seeing? Well, I, I have to say that uh, the pandemic has made some, you know, has had a huge impact in our community. Uh, we are one of the uh, we have some of the highest increase in, in infection rates in the, in the county, in the state. And, um, you know, there's been a tremendous impact here. And our organization has responded Im immediately once we learned about the impact of this. Uh, you know, we immediately went to work. Uh, we, we ensured that all of our, res our services and programs would be remote. We created a telehealth program for all of our clinical services and case management services. Um, we began developing remote programming for youth and adults, education programs, uh, and um, we gathered all of our partners together to make sure that we could respond. One of the things we also did is, is we needed to understand the, the changing needs in the community. So we developed a comprehensive needs assessment uh, and, and uh, we talked to, by, by phone, we talked to hundreds of people in the community, participants in our programs. Uh, we ended up getting responses from about 850 and uh, the data was really stark. Um, over almost 60% of the neighborhood has already lost their job or has, has seen reduced hours as a result of COVID-19. Uh, almost 50% uh, don't have, uh, do not have more than one weeks of food in their house. That's, and, those are huge numbers. Yeah. We, saw, we saw a food bank line earlier today, four or five blocks right. long. So, I mean, to, for viewers watching from around the region, I mean, th this is a pretty scary situation exactly. in a neighborhood like this. You, you, you also deal with a large population of undocumented yes. workers. Um, you know, a lot of folks um, worried that because they don't, they aren't eligible for unemployment insurance or stimulus relief, they can't really make ends meet. So you have a fund we do. to help them. Uh, so it is it is true that if uh, for most for for undocumented people uh they are they're not eligible for any of these types of benefits they're not getting a check from the federal government and so we began fundraising uh thankfully for the covid 19 response fund united way uh the logan foundation we've been able to raise s substantial dollars to get uh 500 checks and food assistance to um hundreds of families in the neighborhood uh, already we've been able to provide 500 checks to 120 families we're going to do we're going to give 30 more families uh tomorrow more funds our goal is to get to 500. We still need to raise those funds, though. We got to keep uh, trying to support these families because they're not getting any other any other support, any other resources. A significant amount you've raised so far, though. Uh, very quickly, you know, gangs have been an issue in this neighborhood. Yes. How has crime uh, been impacted, and, and gang issues been impacted by the coronavirus? I mean, unfortunately, uh, we have not seen a slowdown. Uh, our neighborhood has uh, responded to the violence. Uh, we've created programs with support from from several foundations to to work with the young people on the streets to try to get them these resources support so they can they can stop shooting people. Sure, sure. It's a it's a compounding problem. Patrick yes. Brosnan, thank you so much. Thank you so much. And Brandis, we toss it right back to you and we'll be back to wrap things up from Brighton Park just a little bit later in the program. Unfortunately, the one thing coronavirus hasn't stopped Paris violence. Thank you. Up next, how Major League Baseball survived past pandemics in an all-new Ask Jeffrey. Ask Jeffrey is made possible in part by BMO Harris Bank. Help is what we've always given. So thank you to our helpers at BMO and beyond. Thank you to the healers, the fighters, the all-nighters. 
the cleaners, the movers, the 18 wheelers. Thank you to the farmers, the grocers, the above and beyonders. Thank you to all the frontliners for keeping our lives moving when the world needs to stop. As Chicago baseball fans hunker down and hope for the return of their favorite summertime sport, a viewer wonders how Chicago sports soldiered through the Spanish flu pandemic of 1918. Jeffrey Bayer is here with the story of an October classic played in September in tonight's Ask Jeffrey. Hey, Jeffrey. Hi, Brandis. So the question is, how did professional sports teams handle the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic? I see the Cubs played in 1918. Did fans attend games? Any special fan or player restrictions? And that question comes to us from Ron Vance. Well, not only did the Cubs play in 1918, they were in the World Series in 1918. And three of those games were played in Chicago. Now, if you saw my report last week, uh, um, I'm, when I was talking about the Spanish flu pandemic, um, Chicago officials, of course, banned public gatherings. But as our viewer rightly points out, baseball was not banned. Um, in reality, that's only because the season actually ended before the second really deadly wave of the flu pandemic uh, in the fall of 1918. And that was what really prompted that ban. So was the season shortened because of the flu pandemic? Well, actually, the season was shortened for that other big reason in 1918. Um, America's entry into combat in World War I. Uh, baseball players were declared non-essential workers by the U.S. Secretary of War, something I'm sure Cubs fans would disagree with. Um, and the Secretary of War actually considered canceling the rest of the season as early as July of 1918. Eventually, he, he was persuaded to push that date back to Labor Day, uh, after which time all able-bodied players were obligated to either enlist in the military or go to work for the war effort. It was called work or fight. Um, so around 30 games ended up being cut from the regular season, and the World Series was moved up to early September, and it's still the only October Classic ever played entirely in September. Uh, now, because the worst of the pandemic hadn't hit yet, um, uh, there really weren't any um, of the restrictions that we're familiar with today, like wearing masks or social distancing um, for the fans or for the players. With, with one notable exception, Major League Baseball banned the spitball pitch uh, for obvious reasons. It was thought to be a health risk. Um, and that ban then went on to be permanent in 1920. Yeah, I don't see the spitball pitch uh, making any comebacks. <laughs> uh, Jeffrey, so what happened in the World Series? I'm pretty sure it did not go well for the Cubs. Uh, true, but uh, actually the regular season was fantastic for the Cubs. Um, in 1918, they dominated the National League with an 84-45 and 45 record. Um, they went on to the World Series to face the Red Sox, who had a young ace pitcher by the name of Babe Ruth. Uh, Ruth himself uh, this is amazing, had actually become sick way back in May of that year, probably in the first wave of the flu. Uh, actually, what nearly killed him, though, was the cure. Um, the Red Sox team physician treated him with a supposed flu remedy, silver nitrate, which landed him in the hospital. But he made a full recovery. He went on to hit 11 home runs in May and June, and he played the whole rest of the season. So the first three games of that uh, 1918 World Series were played in Chicago, but not at the Cubs' home field, Wrigley Field, which back then was called Wiegman Park. Um, they were played instead at Comiskey Park um, because it could hold more fans. Uh, the Cubs lost game one in a shutout to Babe Ruth. Um, they went on to win game two. They lost game three. Um, and then the series moved to Boston's Fenway Park, where the Bo Sox took the series in game six. Um, that would be the last Red Sox World Series win for 86 years, a drought that was blamed on the curse of the Bambino, because in 1919, the following year, Babe Ruth's contract was sold to the Red Sox's arch rival, New York Yankees, um, where he helped that team win seven pennants and four championships. And of course, we know that the Cubs had their own curse to deal with for over a century. Um, the flu pandemic actually con con continued on into the 1919 baseball season before subsiding uh, over the summer. But, uh, of course, Chicago baseball fans faced a very different crisis in 1919. Um, as you'll remember, that was when eight 
Chicago White Sox players conspired to throw the World Series against the Cincinnati Reds. That became known as the Black Sox scandal. And Jeffrey, how did other sports fare during the pandemic? Um, well, uh, baseball was by far the, the biggest professional sport back then. There was no NFL, there was no NBA. Um, but the, the flu pandemic forced the postponement of a very high profile boxing match uh, between Jack Dempsey and somebody named Battling Levinsky in Philadelphia. Too bad they didn't cancel that parade in Philadelphia that caused so many problems. Um, college and high school sports were pretty much wiped out for the season two. But maybe the most dramatic uh, thing w uh, was that the one year old National Hockey League was unable to complete the 1919 Stanley Cup finals. Those took place in March of that year. Um, with the series uh, tied, the final game had to be canceled because most of the Montreal Canadiens uh, it, it came down with the flu. Uh, tragically, one of those players actually died a few days after the series. And uh, also the Canadiens' owner and general manager was stricken, and he died in 1921 um, after never fully recovering. Wow. All right. Jeffrey, thanks as always. Stay healthy. And you can find more on this and other Ask Jeffrey questions on our website. And while you're there, be sure to send in your own questions about Chicago to Ask Jeffrey. We're visiting some Chicago arts institutions braving the current storm on the cultural landscape. For 29 years, one small but significant place has been a showcase for visionary artwork. And that is literal as some of the artists claim to have had visions. The art center called into it had to close a new show last month but we got a peek at what you'll see when it reopens. Chicago Tonight arts producer Mark Vitale has a virtual tour inside into it. Bill Trailer was a self-taught American artist born into slavery whose artwork has been compared to Picasso. Howard Finster was a Baptist minister who painted what he titled visionary landscapes as well as album covers for R.E.M. and Talking Heads. Lee Godey was a homeless Chicago woman who made art on the steps of the Art Institute. Intuitive artwork like theirs has been labeled raw or primitive, but like most labels, there isn't a one-size-fits-all definition. Intuit, on Milwaukee Avenue in River West, has an inclusive approach to what is most commonly called outsider art. How we define outsider art here at Intuit, the Center for Intuitive and Outsider Art, is in essence artists who operate outside of the mainstream art world. Rather than their work being informed by the art establishment, um, they have a personal vision that they're compelled to create from, and they often don't have access to traditional art making materials or fancy art supplies, but rather use things that they have at hand. That could mean scrap metal or window shade canvases. One artist made meticulous drawings on stationery from his home at the State Hospital. Chicago is known as one of the first places in the United States to accept and embrace outsider artists. That interest was sparked by a 1951 visit to the Arts Club of Chicago by French artist Jean Dubuffet. A receptive audience heard Dubuffet champion what he called art brut, meaning raw art. All of the works in this exhibition come from the authoritative collection of Victor Keen. Intuit has several shows each year, which can include some of the 1,200 works in their permanent collection. One installation always on view is a window into the world of Henry Darger. Darger was a reclusive Chicago janitor who wrote a 15,000-page illustrated story about an army of girls escaping slavery. His one-bedroom apartment and studio is recreated here with original furniture and possessions. Into its doors may be currently closed to the public, but daily visits by staff ensure the care and maintenance of this uncommon collection. I think into it because of our small size, we're lean but mean. We are in a way uniquely positioned to um, hopefully come out stronger on the other side of this. We're really excited to welcome uh, guests back into our space when that is safe for everybody. And in the meantime, we'll continue to create more and more content so that folks can engage with us online. For Chicago Tonight, this is Mark Vitale. And you can see more outsider art from the Intuit show on our website. Next week, we visit a historic building in Humboldt Park, home of the Museum of Puerto Rican Art and Culture. Up next, cutting through the fog, tips to wearing a face mask and eyeglasses at the same time.
Don't miss one of our stories. Get them all delivered to your desktop or mobile device with a subscription to the WTTW News Daily Briefing. Go to WTTW.com slash Daily Briefing and sign up. Now, as we mentioned earlier in the program, Illinois residents will be required to wear a face mask in public spaces starting May 1st. But as WTTW news reporter Patty Wetley discovered, that requirement might pose a challenge for those of you who wear eyeglasses. Patty joins us now to help us see through the fog. Now, Patty, I know you wear glasses, obviously. Was this a I problem do. for you wearing a mask with your glasses? It totally is. It's actually the same problem that I have in the winter when I have a scarf on. Um, so, you know, with my handy mask on, you know, half my glasses are fogged up and, and I can't see through them, especially if I'm walking and talking and or just even breathing. Um, so, yeah, it's been a problem for sure. Little things like breathing gets you every time. Um, yeah. Just <laughs> so what's the fix? So interestingly enough, this is also a problem that apparently surgeons have. So the National Institutes for Health actually has um, an article on its website for exactly this situation and how to deal with it. And the answer is to wash your glasses in a solution of soapy water, kind of shake them off, let them air dry. And then this film forms on the lenses that when you breathe and the you know moisture comes out of your mouth and hits your glasses, it disperses instead of creating that sort of misty fog that you can't see through. So that's uh, one way to get rid of the problem. And then real quick, I imagine if you wipe your glasses clean, you probably have to do it again <laughs> before you wear them again with your mask, right? Yeah, and there's also some concern for people who have anti-glare coatings on their glasses. So another thing is to get one of those like um, plastic, you know, tie things that come with um, bags of coffee. I have a little example here. And you kind of put a pincer on the mask that will keep um, the mask tighter up against the bridge of your nose. And when it's closer to your face, less moisture gets out so you don't have the problem either. So there's a couple of hacks that right. we mentioned in the article. All right, mask hacks from Patty. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks, Brandis. And you can read Patty's full story on our website where you'll find other face mask tips, as she mentioned. That's at WTTW.com news. And before we go, some viewer feedback. Earlier this week, Carol Marine interviewed one of the leaders of Reopen Illinois. That's a protest organizers are trying to put together for May 1st. Carol asked if violence was a possible tool. If we are not able to express our upset uh, peacefully, and we continue to be squashed. I mean, you know, at what point does uh, does government and you know officials turn this into a, a, a Tiananmen Square type of situation? And now there was a flood of comments about the interview on our social media, including some who were critical of us for having Ellis on the program at all. One viewer writes, "Wow, Chicago tonight decided it would be a good idea to interview a racist quote free speech protest organizer that promotes conspiracy theories on YouTube." When asked if protesters would be discouraged from wearing swastikas, his answer was they would be asked to wear masks. Why would WTTW give him any airtime? A waste of time. Another nutcase like Trump. Horrified that WTTW gave Josh Ellis a lengthy platform without challenging his fringe crackpot claims. Similar protests have been held in other states. Many of you expressed disdain about the idea of protests here in Illinois. One viewer writes, hashtag moronavirus or moronavirus, just can't fix stupid. I would suggest to all health insurance companies that if any of these idiots contract coronavirus, they will not be covered. Unbelievably callous to put so many people at risk. A total lack of empathy for fellow humans here. There will be reversals among many here when close family or friends struggle with COVID that they're responsible for spreading. I say put all the anti-quarantine folks on a list. Distribute the list to hospitals. If they show up seeking treatment, well, sorry. We have to prioritize resources. You knew the risks. And some of our commenters showed a bit of agreement with the proposed protests and their motive. Saw the interview tonight. Ellis seems pretty articulate. As to the violence issue, isn't the state government already engaging in violence by taking away people's rights to make a living? Not even communist governments made work illegal. There's no regard for the people in poverty headed to Chapter 7 or 13 because of their lack of education. Open everything and save the people who are dying from no unemployment checks or jobs. 
As always, we appreciate hearing from you. Join the discussion on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, or post your comments on our website. And Paris Schutz joins us again from Chicago's Brighton Park neighborhood, where he's been reporting all day. Paris, you've been on the ground in other communities this week as well. What's your takeaway from some of the stories you've heard? Well, Brandis, I want to say a bit about small businesses and getting that PPP stimulus loan fund. You know, a lot of your success was tied on whether your bank, which acted as the pass-through, was part of the SBA loan program. So if not, you, if they're your banker, you're out of luck. You don't get those loans. We also heard businesses that had relationships, personal relationships with their bank or community banks, and they were part of that loan program. They had much better luck as opposed to if you do banking with a large multinational bank, you leave messages, emails, and you don't hear anything, you're shut out of the program. So it's a total hodgepodge. And Brandis, we heard the governor today extend that stay-at-home order. What did you make of that? You know, I, I didn't think it was a, a shock. I think a lot of folks were getting kind of antsy. We knew it was coming. We just didn't know how long he would extend it for, um, especially in the last week or so when we've heard that, you know, our projected, uh, the time at which we would actually flatten the curve, our peak had been pushed from mid-April back to mid to late May. And I think last week was also an indicator when he closed schools. So I think a lot of folks just needed to hear what his plan was and how long was th this was going to go on in right. that form, so. Right, uh, inevitable. Yeah, so that's our show for this Thursday night. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily briefing. And you can get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and our website, wttw.com slash news. And you can also get the show via podcast and the PBS video app. And please join us tomorrow night live at 7. Now, for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Brandis Friedman. And I'm Paris Schutz. Thank you so much for watching. Stay healthy, stay safe, and we will hopefully see you tomorrow for the Week in Review. Closed captioning for this program is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, pleased to give back to the community through numerous charitable initiatives.